I'm Renee Williams. And I'm Billy Thomas. And welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. Well, hi, I'm Renee Williams. And I'm Billy Thomas. And welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. You know, we have trees, trees, trees. That's it's all I'm about trees, about. right? Exactly. You know, what? one of the great sayings we say um, amongst the Society of American Foresters members are trees are the answer. And today we got lots of answers because it's exactly. like... Like Renee said, it's all about trees. So, uh, you know, certainly we love wildlife and um, all our natural resources, but today's show is pretty tree centric. Um, we've got Dr. Ellen Crocker's got a couple of great videos for us. One's on selecting um, the appropriate tree, you know, make sure you pick the right tree. And that's so important, Renee. These are your long term investments of your time and your property. So, you want to make sure you have the right tree um, before you get it in the ground. And then Laurie's going to show us a beautiful tree. I won't mention that one yet, but we'll see that in a little little bit later. And then we're going to wrap up with a tree planting of a bald and burlap tree. And um, we've also got our, our partners on here, Eric and Darren, and they've got some experience um, with a lot of bare root tree planting. So we might talk about that a little bit as well. So if you've got questions about tree planting, today is your day. So um, please ask away. But I'm really excited. Glad to have you all with us. If you're on Zoom, please use the chat function. And if you're on Facebook Live, you can use the comment section. We'll respond. And if you're on YouTube, um, um, holler back at us at UK Forestry and we'll respond to you there as well. So definitely excited about today. Wonderful tree day. <laughs> trees, trees, trees. Trees. And you know, you always say they're the answer. And I always like, yep, no matter what the question. <laughs> I know. We can make it about trees. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. It's very forester centric, but oh, okay. Oh, it works. It yeah. works. <laughs> All right. So let's get started. Uh, Dr. Crocker, if you want to join us. Hey everyone. Hey Ellen, how are you? Doing great. Good morning. So tell us a little bit about the segments you're going to uh, show today. Well, first we're going to talk a little bit about how to pick your perfect tree when you're shopping because there are so many choices out there. And especially if you're looking around at your local retail garden center and you're trying to decide, you know, should you get a bare root tree or a container grown tree or a bald and burlap tree and then which species should you get? Um, it can be intimidating, uh, but spring's a great time to plant trees. And so we wanted to give you some tips for how to to, uh, pick the perfect tree for your spot. All right, well, let's get going. All right. Uh, so today I'm here with Josh Kite. He's an extension associate in the Department of Horticulture at the University of Kentucky, and he specializes in nursery crops, which is great for where we are today. All right, so we're here at Springhouse Gardens. It's one of the premier land, uh, retail garden centers here in central Kentucky, and they have a very, very wide selection of trees. They have everything from native shade trees to ornamental trees to a great native selection and other ornamentals to plant in your yard. When you're shopping for a tree, there are a lot of different options. Um, there are different options in terms of what type of tree you could get. You could get a bald and burlap tree that's gonna be wrapped and typically larger, heavier, but maybe give you a more permanent um, uh, established tree look right away. You could get a container grown tree that's gonna be easier to move around, but also likely to have some roots that are circling inside that container that you'll wanna prune before putting it into the ground. Or you could get a bare root seedling. Now those trees aren't gonna come with a lot of soil, uh, so those roots are really susceptible to drying out and you've gotta be careful to keep them moist before you plant them, but those are great trees and typically have really good root systems, so likely to thrive once they're in the ground. There's no right choice, just different options depending on what's available to you and what you want. This is a ball and burlap tree. This tree was not grown here, so this was brought in from a nursery, hopefully here in Kentucky. <clears throat> um, so what you're seeing here is in the field, this tree is grown in soil. And so they come and harvest it with a, a piece of machinery called a tree spade. On the outside of it, you're gonna see a wire basket, you're gonna see burlap, and you're gonna see this string. So basically when it comes out of the ground, they're gonna already have a basket that's set there, and they're gonna have burlap setting in the basket. They're gonna take the tree spade with the tree in it after it's dug, they're gonna lower the tree down into the basket, <clears throat> And then the reason we're seeing some breakdown here, first off, this is what it's supposed to do. 
the burlap is supposed to break down and since they're using an organic manila twine that's supposed to break down as well so basically after you pick this up from here if you were to purchase it you're going to take this to your house and before you plant the tree you're going to you know remove the rope out from around it cut some of the burlap off from around the top and then you're going to want to expose it and get it down to the buttress or the root flare and then you're going to want to there's a couple tricks that you can do to remove the wire out from around it if your root ball is moist and it's falling apart or if it's too dry and it's falling apart you can leave the basket on it but you're going to want to remove as much of the basket as possible especially when you're rolling it in the hole <clears throat> One of the easy ways that I like to do it is you lay the tree over on its side. You're going to see on the bottom of a basket, there's going to be some rungs that you can cut out. Remove all the rungs at the bottom, put it into a hole, and then take your bulk cutters and cut down the side of the basket. Then you can remove it and then backfill as, backfill as needed to plant your tree correctly. This tree is what you call a container tree. It's a little bit easy, it's a lot, I'm not gonna say a little bit, it's a lot easier to handle than your ball and burlap tree. Not everybody wants to tackle a two inch, two and a half inch, three inch ball and burlap tree. You've got your container tree, it's grown in a substrate, which means that it doesn't have any native soil with it. You're gonna take it home, you're gonna dig your hole, then you're gonna lay it on the side and you're gonna take a razor blade knife and you're gonna cut down the side of the pot and expose the root system. First thing you're going to do is you're going to look at the root system and it's going to be making a bunch of circles around that. What you're going to want to do is you're going to want to take a sharp knife and you're going to want to cut down each side about four times and expose those roots and rough them up and then you're going to want to plant it, then you can put it in your hole at the proper planting depth. There are so many different choices for great species, um, and it depends on what you want. Uh, you need to match what you're looking for in terms of your goals. Do you want beautiful fall leaf color? Do you want a big shade tree? Um, maybe do you have power lines overhead and you need something that's gonna stay a little bit smaller? There's no one right tree, but there are good trees for your site and trees that are not such good selections. So keeping that in mind when you're shopping will make you happier with the final outcome. This tree that we're looking at right here is a Corcus macrocarpa, otherwise a bur oak, you can't get any more Kentucky than this. These are the big trees that you see out in the majestic trees that you see out in the middle of horse farms and big tree, uh, in big paddocks. So we were walking through the nursery and this is one of the ones that I wanted to, it's a <clears throat> tulip poplar, Lyrodendron tulipifera for the scientific name. And this one we just stopped and looked at because it actually has very, very good form for it. As you're going up, you're noticing that the branches have great spacing, there's no cross branching, and it has a really, really, really nice straight leader. So this is the kind of stuff that you're looking for in purchasing a great tree. Not to say anything about Lowe's or Home Depot's, like yeah, you can go there and you can get trees that look really, really nice, but a lot of them, since they're just looking at price point and price point only, they're going to go with the cheapest plant all the time. So you may not get a tree that's had the time and effort put into it to make it look nice and straight and to make sure that it doesn't have crossing branches. You could have something that could look like a darn Z or a curly Q or something like that because <clears throat> people are only going to put the amount of money into a tree when they're growing it that they're getting paid for it. So this tree, while it is expensive, you're getting a great product compared to something that might be a little bit cheaper but might have some more problems. All right, so here we're showing a different type of tree. This is a river birch. We always talk about the right tree in the right place. This is a great tree. It's a fast growing tree, but you don't want to plant it right next to your house. You want to plant it about 15 feet up from your house. You see all around Lexington and all kinds of places where people will plant this right next to their house. This thing's fast growing, has an aggressive root system. If you plant it too close, it's going to get in your foundation. It's going to cause all kinds of problems. Right. So here we have a Kentucky coffee tree. You know, we've been talking about form, trying to find a straight leader and all that kind of stuff. I will tell you that you can find a Kentucky coffee tree with a straight leader and nice branching and all that kind of stuff, but it's really difficult. These are one of the harder trees to grow straight. <clears throat> 
in the nursery because they want to do what they want to do. You can stake them and train them and try to prune for a leader, but all these specimens that we have here are all acceptable trees that you would want to plant on your landscape in the landscape of a Kentucky coffee tree. You're not going to notice this when this tree gets to its true potential. It'll still be doing what it wants, but it's going to look like a true Kentucky coffee tree. This is a great street tree. It's tolerant of a lot of stuff, a lot of different sites. Pretty much this tree will grow anywhere. I think I could even keep this alive. I'm not known for having a green thumb, but I'm pretty sure I could keep a Kentucky coffee tree alive. All right, so we've been talking about bald and burlap trees, container trees, bare root trees, native trees. We've been talking about large shade trees. Well, we've talked about earlier about the right tree in the right spot, and we've yet to talk about a small tree. Well, we have one here for you. This is a Sweet Babe Magnolia. It's gonna have a really nice fragrant flower semi-evergreen and it's only going to get about 25 foot tall so if you have a small place that you want to plant one in like a patio you can fit that in there if you want to put something under if you got some power lines you're worried about it getting power lines you can use this it makes a great accent plant when you get it in a multi-trunk form and we also that what you don't you see it mostly in the multi-trunk form and you see it planted on like the corner of houses um, around patios but another thing this thing can make a nice ornamental small shade tree as well if you get it what's available in the single trunk form which we have here now this is a beautiful tree you can let it go crazy and let it go all natural or you can trim it up into its ornamental form so this is one of my personal favorite smaller trees and that's the pawpaw it's a native tree and I like it because it makes uh, delicious fruit especially some of these cultivars like they're selling here um, the other nice thing about it is that it's not going to grow too tall so if you've got a space that you really can't grow that high into it's going to stay a smaller tree and there really are some great smaller trees for those areas all right so we're back to small trees again. Flowering ornamentals was considered an understory tree or an edge of the woods tree would be your flowering dogwood. <clears throat> Some people, you see it all the time, they plant them in direct sunlight with no shade and they seem to be thriving well. I don't understand how that works, but I guess some of them do better in direct sunlight than others. But if you had a nice mature trees like some I don't know, some nice tall oaks, something you could fit this under. This would make a great addition to your landscape, especially if you, like I said, you already have some mature trees and you want to come in and put some color in early spring and then a nice tree after that. You could put in your red buds or your flowering dogwoods. All right, so here we've been talking about ball and burlap trees. We've been talking about container trees. This is kind of a container tree too, but I don't know. This is what you would consider maybe a liner tree or something that could possibly be planted bare root. Not everybody wants to handle a big tree. These trees have their place too. It's like Ellen said, or like Ellen has said before, is that, you know, there's no right answer. Now, if you do want to buy a smaller tree, you're going to have to put some work into it to make it a nice specimen. You're going to have to work on the leader yourself and you're going to have to prune for structure on your tree. Whereas if you buy a bigger tree, you know, the nurseries put a lot of work into it. What we have here is a straight species white oak. And I will let you know, this is a Kentucky proud tree. It was grown by a nursery that was over in Paris that is sold to <clears throat> Springhouse Gardens, available for people to come and plant in their yard. So thanks for joining us today. Uh, we had fun. I hope you had fun too. Uh, make sure you visit your independently owned retail garden center this week. Buy a tree and plant it and enjoy it for years to come. If you want to learn more, make sure to check out the website and um, hope to hear from you if you have any questions. Well, thank you, Ellen. We greatly appreciate that. And I love watching the videos that you all do about uh, trees and, you know, all your bugs, the bugs and everything else. Is, they're just awesome to watch. <laughs> well, and I have to brag on my co-presenter there, Josh Kite. So when he and I did this video, I think it was last fall, um, he was uh, working at UK and Extension, and now he is working with Bailey Nursery. So uh, okay. still working with trees and planting them even more so. Uh, so just kind of wanted to give a shout out to Josh there and all of his great work. Um, but hopefully it walked you through some of the things that you might see if you go to one of those centers, because I think what a lot of folks do is that they know they want to plant a tree, 
and they might know where they want to go, but then they'll go to uh, Lowe's or Home Depot um, and just see what's available. Um, but I think if you can uh, kind of go in knowing exactly what you want, uh, you'll be a lot more happy with the outcome long term. Yeah, I thought you made some great points in the video. It's such a long-term deal. So you want to make sure you've got the right tree. <laughs> um, it's so important. And I've seen, you know, some of those examples of planning them too close to the house happen and it causes a lot of grief. So yeah, great video, Ellen. You covered a lot of great species and a lot of great tips. So really good stuff. Yeah, and there is, people ask me a lot, you know, what tree should I plant? What species should I plant? And the truth is there's no one right species or, you know, secret to which is the best tree. It totally depends. It depends on the site. You know, does it drain well? Does it hold water? What's the sunlight? Uh, it depends on what you want. Like, do you want a shade tree? Are you concerned about it being messy? Or do you like messiness? You know, do, do you want a fruit tree? Uh, do you want a flowering? tree and um you know there's so much diversity to the species that are out there that you could plant um, that's not really represented a lot of times and what you might see commonly planted but if you do a little digging especially kind of with some of your local nurseries and retailers you might be able to find trees that like you had no idea this was we, the kentucky coffer tree is one of those that i think is awesome and is under planted in our landscape settings you know you'll see it out on you know uh, along the side of the road as you're driving on the highway and those horse farms, those seed pods that are still held there. And I think it looks beautiful. Um, and but you don't see that much of it planted. And Josh raised a few reasons for why that might be, but they have to do more with like challenges in the nursery setting versus challenges in your yard. Um, so I think there's just so many good choices out there. Yeah. With I over see 100 native species, you're totally right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, I see in the chat someone mm -hmm. has commented that they have um, princess trees and uh, they're kind of wondering, you know, about those and, and where they came from. So princess tree or polonia is a non-native tree species that's considered invasive in Kentucky and in many other states because, you know, it's invasive. So it's not native to here and it causes problems. What does it do? It kind of takes over areas and can seed in. So spread its seeds and seed in. And there are actually a lot of them around. You might be wondering, like, where could this tree have come from? Um, but there are a fair number of them. Uh, I, you know, just on the side of the road uh, where you least expect them. And uh, sometimes people will even try to plant them uh, thinking that, oh, they grow so fast. Maybe this will be good for the environment. And I encourage you, we have lots of fabulous native trees that are very good for the environment. We do not need to be promoting <laughs> those, those invasive species. Um, but, you know, it's, it's always interesting to see where these trees come from. From. And we do, you know, trees like Polonia or Mimosa or Tree of Heaven, um, invasive trees that you don't want to see, they will sprout up where you least expect them. Um, the one that I'm seeing the most of lately is Calorie Pear. Um, that one has just been filling in all of our roadsides and old fields. Mm -hmm. um, the good news is that uh, there are those calorie pear are coming from uh, planted Bradford pears or other cultivars of calorie pear. And there are lots of great native trees that could be alternatives and kind of fit in that landscape setting. If you're looking for a native tree that's going to kind of stay smaller and have beautiful spring flowers, I mean, you can't do better than redbud or serviceberry or um, any number of fantastic native trees. I showed a, a flowering dogwood there. There was a sweet bay magnolia. Um, there's just so many different options that are out there. Uh, you can upgrade those, those Bradford pears. Yeah. And I see a note in the chat, um, another invasive tree that I didn't mention, golden rain tree. That one's kind of on the watch list as well. You know, it's, it's hard to know what's going to become invasive until it's already a problem, right? Already problem. <laughs> until it's already spread. Hindsight is, is great, but until something becomes a problem, we don't really know. And golden rain tree has been found to be invasive in other areas. And so that's kind of why it's on the watch list to see what happens here. Now, I have been to places where it sure seems to be invading, uh, you know, your yard or locally. Um, so I'd say keep an eye on your golden rain tree if you have it. And if you don't, maybe, maybe pick something else for your landscape. 
lots to choose from as you've covered. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Go native. Yes. Definitely. So thank you so much, Ellen. We greatly appreciate um, mm -hmm. all your comments on that. And you'll be back here. Yeah, we'll see you again. Yeah, we gave them a little talk about it. Yeah, yeah, we'll be back because I think one of the most common ways that people buy trees um, is bald and burlapped trees. Mm -hmm. um, but they can be a challenge, right? They're, the, I don't know if you could tell in those photos, uh, the root ball that goes with those is huge. Mm -hmm. The nice thing about that is the tree is also huge. So you get this instant tree feel. Uh, the downside is that it's um, going to be a lot harder to plant. Uh, so I'll give you some tips for that. Yeah. Well, yeah, quick one on crepe myrtle. Just stop in about what do you think about crepe myrtle? You know, crepe myrtle, beautiful, uh, lovely, lovely, non-native, um, not invasive. Uh, at the same time, it's not terribly cold hardy in our area. So you'll have some problems with it dying back from time to time. Okay. Excellent. Oh, All right. Good right. Let's move on to our tree of the week and we'll be right back with Ellen. In the yes. <laughs> Hi, hey, Laura. Hey. Good morning. How's everyone? Oh, we're doing fine. Tell us a little bit about the tree of the week. All right, so this is, um, we are doing one that's starting to flower right now and it's black cherry and it's actually leafed out quite a bit. It's one of the trees that will leaf out a little of our natives that will leaf out a little bit earlier um, and we're starting to see the flowers. And it's a great tree. Um, it's definitely one we find all over the landscape. We'll find it in hedgerows. Sometimes it'll pop up in your yard, obviously because of the fruit that is so desirable that birds eat and then spread the seed. Um, but here is Tree of the Week Black Cherry. Hi, I'm Laurie Thomas with the UK Department of Forestry and Natural Resources, and I'm here with the Tree of the Week, the Black Cherry, Prunus serratina. It's also known as Wild Black Cherry, Rum Cherry, and Mountain Black Cherry. Black cherry, the largest of the native cherries and the main one of commercial value, is also an important tree for wildlife. It typically grows 60 to 80 feet tall and up to 2 to 3 feet in diameter. It grows best in rich, deep, moist soils, but is classified as shade intolerant, so commonly found in successional vegetation or forest openings, old fields, and along fence rows. It can live to be 150 to 200 years old. It is found throughout the eastern United States with several geographic variants, as you can see in the range map. There are numerous varieties in Texas, Mexico, and Guatemala. Black cherry flowers are small and white and are grouped in hanging narrow clusters called racemes. The clusters are typically four to six inches long. The flowers are perfect and are insect pollinated by several species of flies and several species of bees, including the honey bee. The leaves are deciduous alternately ranged on the stem, and they are simple, which means they are composed of just one blade. The leaf is two to five inches long, and it's oblong to lance-shaped with finely serrated margins. They are dark green and lustrous above, and paler below during the growing season. The autumn color varies from a striking red to a golden yellow. The fruit is a dark purple round droop, almost black when ripened, which is where the tree gets its common name from, black cherry. The droops are about one third inch in diameter with a bitter sweet taste. They typically ripen in late summer into September. Best seed production is between 30 and 100 years of age. Some seed is produced most years with good seed crops at one to five year intervals. The bulk of the seed crop fall to the ground within the vicinity of the parent tree. However, some seed is scattered by songbirds and mammals, such as fox and bear. Black cherry fruits are an important source of soft mast for many non-game songbirds, such as the brown thrasher, the cedar waxwing, and the eastern bluebird, some of my favorite birds. Black cherries are also an important food source for several game birds, including the ruffed grouse, wild turkey, and northern bobwhite. Fox, raccoons, squirrels, and rabbits also eat the fruit, and the cherries have been described as a favorite of black bears. The bark is smooth with numerous short, narrow, horizontal lenticels when the tree is young. It becomes very dark, nearly black, breaking into small, rough, irregular upturned plates when it gets older. Some have described it as looking like burnt cornflakes. The most important defoliating insects that attack black cherry include eastern tent caterpillar, which is a pest that is native to North America. Their populations vary from year to year, with outbreaks occurring every several years. 
The caterpillars hatch from shiny egg masses that contain between 150 to 400 eggs that have been deposited on the black cherry tree as well as apples and crab apples the prior fall. Once they hatch in early spring, the caterpillars from one or more egg mass will build silken nests in the host tree. They emerge from the nest in early morning or late evening and even feed and even overnight to feed on the leaves in late spring and early summer. Large groups can defoliate entire trees, but the trees typically recover and put out a new growth of leaves. Black knot is a common but serious native disease of cherries and wild plums. The disease is caused by the fungus Apiosporina morbosa. It causes elongated rough black swelling several times the diameter of the normal stem. Small twigs may be killed within a year after the infection. Large canker swellings a foot or more in length may occur on the trunks of larger trees, and where several such lesions are scattered along the bulb, the tree is worthless for lumber. Pruning the affected areas with proper sanitation of the removed area is the primary means for dealing with black knot. The wood, especially from large, high-quality trees, is highly valued and used for furniture and veneer. These trees are typically found in a small range in the Allegheny Plateau of Pennsylvania, New York, and West Virginia. The heartwood is pinkish-brown when first cut and darkens to medium-red-brown when exposed to light. The sapwood tends to be a pale yellowish color. The grain is usually straight and easy to work. It is known as being one of the best all-around woods for workability. The wood is commonly used for cabinetry, furniture, flooring, turned objects, and small specialty wood items. The national champion black cherry is in Licking, Ohio. It's 196 inches in circumference, which is over 16 feet. It's 111 feet tall with a 79-foot crown spread. Kentucky's champion black cherry is in Hardin County. It's 202 inches in circumference, 89 feet tall, with a 70-foot crown spread. If you'd like to know more about champion trees, check out American Forest Champion Tree National Register or the Kentucky Division of Forestry Champion Trees. Now for a few fun facts about black cherry. The twigs, leaves, and bark of the black cherry contain cyanide in a bound form as a cyanogenic glycoside. When the foliage wilts, the cyanide is released and can be potentially lethal to livestock. Deer and rabbit also eat the foliage, but not when it's wilted so they are not harmed. Black cherry grows the largest of all cherries in North America. Pioneers in the Appalachian Mountain used the fruit to flavor rums or brandy to make a drink called Cherry Bounce. The fruit was also used to make jams and jellies. The scientific name Pruna serotina is from the Greek prunos, which means plum or cherry, while serotina is from the Latin cirrus, which means late, and refers to the late ripening fruit. I hope you've enjoyed the black cherry today and get the opportunity to get out into your neighborhood, a local park, or your woodland and enjoy the beauty of the black cherry. I just wanted to let you know we've got a lot of chat coming on, um, going on here. One was about the horse industry and how mm -hmm. the black cherry affected that. Right. And I'm in, and I saw Mac put that in there and I, I was trying to remember, I didn't Google it, but um, I, I had it in my head that it was had to do with the frass, which is, you know, that the caterpillars are eating leaves and it's their excrement. Um, but Dr. Crocker seems to remember that it might actually be the hairs on the caterpillars that the, um, that the horses and it's the pregnant mares when they eat that, that insect, that hair on there causes, can cause them to um, spontaneously abort. So that was a, a big issue back in gosh, was it the 90s, I think, maybe? I can't, it seems like it's been a long time ago, but there was a big push to remove a lot of black cherries along um, paddocks and, fin, you know, fence rows where we had, they kept the pregnant mares, so. Okay. And then the other one, Mac, had popped up was um, about the size of, what's the difference between a shrub and a tree? And Dr. Crocker also chimed in on that one too. And that's one of those that um, you'll find lots of different definitions. You go through any of your dendrology books and a tree is defined as um, a single stemmed <laughs> woody plant that's at least 20 feet tall with a you know a distinctive crown. But we, we see other things that are called trees that sometimes have, just depending on where they're growing, might end up with multiple stems and maybe not a very distinct crown. So it's one of those that's kind of a a hard, there's not a real hard and fast definition like we have with some things, it kind of moves around a little bit, but generally shrubs tend to be multi-stemmed and tend to be somewhat smaller than trees, which tend to be, we think of them as being more single-stemmed, so okay. hopefully that helps, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. <laughs>
<laughs> so yes, the black cherry. Hopefully, you all get out and get to see it. I, I noticed it. Um, we had our state 4-H forestry contest um yesterday down at Raven Run, McCreary County. Um, won. Um, so they will be representing the state, representing Kentucky at the National Forestry Invitational. But that was the one tree that real that and box elder had all leafed out, and the flowers were already starting to form. The yeah. students knew exactly what it was because they saw the flowers. So awesome. Yeah. Awesome. That's Thank awesome. you, Laurie. Appreciate those yeah. as always. Right. Have a good day. Right. So, Dr. Crocker is back. <laughs> Circling back around again. Me again? How oh, exciting. <laughs> the Ellen show, yes. <laughs> Yeah, so now we get part two. We're going to talk a little bit about, so you've got your tree, you have picked out your tree, and how do you actually get it into the ground in a way that's going to set it up for success going forward? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it seems really simple, like the trees plant themselves, right? How hard can it be? <laughs> like we have... <laughs> We have a whole forest of trees going that nobody had to plant. Um, so how hard could it be, right? Um, but there are some challenges when we're trying to plant them. Uh, and there are some things that can go wrong, which maybe aren't going to kill your tree right away, but your tree will struggle. It won't thrive in the way that it could be. And you pay a lot of money for these trees, especially those bald and burlapped trees. So you might as well set it up for success and set yourself up for happiness into the future as well. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, we'll watch your segment and then we'll I'll answer some of the questions that I think have already been asked. <laughs> yeah, we'll keep them coming, folks. All right, we'll get that going. Bald and burlap trees are a great way to add instant canopy and tree feel to your landscape, but they also come with their own challenges. Compared to bare root or container grown seedlings, that root ball is a lot larger, and that means they're gonna be heavier and harder to maneuver. In this video, we're gonna talk a little bit about planting bald and burlap trees and give you some tips for success. The first step in planting your bald and burlapped tree is picking the perfect tree and the perfect site for it. Think about how big that tree is going to grow in the future. Um, is it gonna be a tall shade tree? Is it gonna be a smaller flowering tree? And are there any potential conflicts in the site you wanna plant it? Overhead utilities, things below ground. Always make sure to check with your utility company, call 811 or check them out online to make sure that you're not setting yourself up for problems in the future. Another thing to think about once you've got your tree there at the site is its condition. Find the root flare. Is it really far buried in that root ball? And do you need to kind of identify that first before getting started? And are there branches that need to be pruned, either dead branches or things that could improve the structure of the tree long-term? It's a lot easier to do that when the tree is on the ground with you than when it's standing upright. You wanna dig a hole that's about two to three sizes the width of your root ball. This can seem really wide, but instead of thinking of it as a deep hole, you want to think of it more like a shallow pancake. Um, something that's going to be large, but also pretty shallow, only the depth of your root flare. So you can measure where your root flare is on your bald and burlapped tree. You might need to dig down and unpack that soil to find it, and then measure from there to the bottom of that root ball. That's the depth that your hole needs to be. Any deeper and your tree might have problems because it was planted too deep. After you've got your hole dug, you want to place your tree in that hole. And this can be easier said than done because these root balls can be really heavy. Fortunately, they've got some wire around them that you can use the wire handles to kind of position it. And I think easier to roll it into that hole than to pick it up and place it. Um, but you will probably want to cut away some of the bottom of that wire before you do that because otherwise it's going to be hard to remove once it's in the hole. If you want to remove all of the packing material, the twine, the wire, the burlap that you can. The more of this you remove, the better. It'll facilitate those roots growing through the soil. You may need to use wire cutters to get as much of that wire off as you can. And I think a lot of people think that this doesn't need to be done. These things will degrade over time. And while that's true over a long time, it might not be true during the time your tree needs for its roots to grow. 
Next, you're gonna wanna level your tree, and by that I mean make sure that the trunk is pointing up instead of over to the side. That may sound simple, but it's really easy for it to look good one from, from one direction, but not so great from another, so make sure you're looking at it from all sides. Once you have the tree where you want it to be, start gently backfilling soil in, and keep looking at its level to make sure it hasn't tipped over to the side. That'll help hold that tree in place. While you're doing this, it's also a good time to make sure that the root flare is where you think it is and not buried beneath a lot of soil. Make sure you dig down and find that point at which the trunk starts to flare out to those lateral roots. That's what you want either in line with the soil or just above it. You definitely don't want that too far below ground. That can stress your tree out and cause problems into the future. After you've placed and positioned your tree, make sure you backfill with soil that you dug from that hole. Don't bring in new potting mix or compost. Uh, that can encourage the roots to stay in that hole instead of moving out and developing that really nice root system that you want for your tree long term. Do that gently so you don't want to compact that soil too much. And after you've filled in with that soil, make sure to water your tree. Not only is this something to do right away, but something you're going to continue doing, um, especially in the first year of that tree's growth. The process of creating a bald and burlap uh, root ball um, really cuts off a lot of the tree's root system. And so you want to give that tree extra water while it's putting on new roots. And you might even want to consider putting a water bag around your tree to ensure that that can be done properly. Another great thing to do right now is going to be to add mulch around your tree. Uh, just keep in mind that this should be pretty shallow, just a few inches of mulch, and don't pile that mulch up against your tree trunk. Nobody likes a mulch volcano, especially not your trees. Well there you have it! Those are our tips for successfully planting bald and burlapped trees. Make sure you check us out online and follow us on social media if you'd like to learn more, and I wish you lots of success in your tree planting. Well, thank you, Ellen. Um, I love all your segments. And, you know, we have talked about bare root. We've talked about containers. We've talked about bald and burlap trees. So we've talked about a lot of different types of trees today. And, you know, one thing I was wondering is, you know, these are pretty much for landscape trees, right? What if you have a field you're trying to redo or what have you, and then you don't you can't go buy container trees for those <laughs> <laughs> but you've got a lot of money right yeah. Yeah. so um what happens then well i know that we have someone joining us today who's got a lot of experience with this actually a couple different people eric gracie and darren morris um because probably what you're going to want to do is plant bare root seedlings instead and the kentucky division of forestry is an excellent source of those. Um, they have a nursery that provides really high quality bare root seedlings at a very affordable price. And those can be fantastic choices for those larger scale tree plantings. So Eric, do you want to chat with us a little bit about that and kind of your tips for successful yeah. bare root planting? Um, so there's actually uh, the beauty of a bare root, uh, unlike bald and burlap that you mentioned in your video, you get the vast majority of that root system. Uh, so you that so you don't have as much transplant shock. Also, the affordability makes it uh, well suited for uh, you know agro you know reforest in an old crop field or uh, or uh, you're converting pasture to woods and you want to make sure you get a good mix of uh, tree species in in that field. Um, the 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 key there's a couple methods. Uh, uh, it's a dibble bar is a lot of times used for planting bare root seedlings. There's instructions. Uh, there's plenty of videos on how to use the dibble bar. Those are really good if you're looking at just a few hundred trees, depending on how big of an area you're planting. If you've got a large planting, there is a um, mechanical, tr mechanical tree setter. Now you can't do that on all topography. If you can't run a tra tractor on the site, you can't use a tree setter, but that is by far the best method for getting uh, a lot of tree seedlings in the ground and actually does the best job of, it's kind of like an old tobacco setter for folks that have experience with that. Uh, um, some of the other things uh, that you'll hear people talk about on some of these larger reforestation projects is tree shelters. Uh, tree shelters are, are good. I can't say that they're not. Uh, I typically do not re recommend them just from the, the cost standpoint. And if you don't maintain your tree shelters, I've seen so many planting jobs where the wind hits 
that tree shelter, the tree shelter is blown sideways and the seedling inside the tree shelter is now growing sideways. So it's one of those where if you're gonna put on tree shelters, you gotta expect to have periodic maintenance of those, uh, of those shelters. And then the other thing I see people making mistakes with is they leave the shelters on and then the trees get up above the tree shelter and then the tree starts blowing in the wind and the tree shelter will actually rub that stem and to the point where it will cause pretty significant damage or even cut that cut the uh, the stem in half. And then you're starting over from, and you've lost your apical dominance on that seedling and what have you. But, uh, okay. it, you know, I was gonna say- Yeah, go ahead, Billy. I was gonna um, ask you to speak a little bit about, you know, the things that Ellen was talking about earlier, you know, selecting the right tree for the right place. Um, that still applies in these large scale plantings, right? And maybe talk a little bit about working with a forester to kind of help yeah. guide you in some of that. Yeah, certainly the Kentucky Division of Forestry would help make recommendations on the areas that you were trying to replant. They're going to look at your topography, the slope, and uh, uh, the aspect of where you're trying to plant, um, the soil types, uh, to make some good recommendations on a good mix of a lot of folks wanted, like right now, white oak is uh, valuable and a, and a hot commodity. Walnut's always been valuable and a hot commodity. Uh, so a lot of folks will just focus on those types of uh, tree, tree plantings, but really a diverse mix in that planting will help uh, help ensure that you got good survival of different species uh, and be better for wildlife and ecological standpoint. But certainly I've seen plenty of walnut plantations. Uh, I assume we'll start seeing some walnut or white oak plantations popping up too, just because of, of the value that's uh, uh, taking place. Um, the other thing that, that that I recommend is, is plant some trees in your mix that you may not, that because spacing of those planted trees can become an issue at some point in time. So I always like to have some black locusts or something that the landowner doesn't have problems uh, psychologically removing from that planting. So they make good fence posts and good firewood. And that way you're thinning that planted stand to promote growth on the trees that you're trying to promote for your next timber crop. And uh, so, you know, consider that a little bit too. And those will be things that the forester will talk to you about. Yeah. If you do have psychological problems removing uh, the smaller oaks that are in there, just, just plant them with shiitakes afterwards. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Second life, right? Yeah. <laughs> so Eric, we had a few questions in the chat about trees with tap roots and the challenges of, of that from the transplanting perspective. And transplanting established trees is surprisingly hard. How old are the small trees uh, that can KDF grows when they are lifted? We, we, we grew a one-year-old seedling and a two-year-old seedling. Occasionally on some of the really slower, uh, like sugar maple, uh, there would be a 3-0 tree, but typically it was a, a one or two-year-old seedling. Um, and on that, you know, at that, you know, when they remove that uh, seedling, there's a the machine comes in there and if you start getting those longer tap rooms, it's going to sever that tap root so it's straight and not growing sideways. Where I see this tap root issue coming up a lot of time is on containerized seedlings. So they're normal, the containers will have a hole out in the bottom of them and that tap root will hit the, you know, run through the hole of the container and then they're going to have it on hard pan or some type of uh, where their containers are and then it'll run sideways. And on those, I always recommend cutting that tap root that's coming out of the bottom and get it straight and kind of start stuff over from scratch. Um, and if you're buying bald and burlapped trees, that has also already been done. So there's a, a good portion of that root system has been severed. Um, so that's something to keep in mind because not only is that gonna impact, I mean, those trees can lose their tap roots, like that's not necessarily going to kill the tree, um, but, that tree has also lost a lot of its root system. So it's gonna need extra help um, getting water access, especially as it's getting established. And it's really important that in that early stage, it puts on new root growth because if it doesn't, then it's gonna have trouble getting enough water to support itself. So what happens like you get, you know, you go, you go to an event and they give you a tree seedling, right? Um, should you just 
plant it in the ground or should you actually plant it in a pot? I saw that one of the, one of the questions was that. Um, should you put it in a container first and then transplant it or is it best just to try to let it take off from the ground? Personally, I think you're better off putting, going ahead and putting it in the ground uh, and just, uh, flag it so you don't run over it with a lawnmower. Small. <laughs> uh, also, um, on seedlings, bare root seedlings, particularly, you're better off erring on the side of being a little bit too deep. And this is completely opposite of bald and burlap and container. There's an old saying uh, on bald and burlap uh, is planted high, it never dies. <laughs> You want to uh, err on the side of being a little bit high versus a little deep. Um, but what happens, you can do the container. You certainly can, but most of the containers are black. And if you're not careful, you that pot gets so hot uh, that you can have trouble with that ceiling that you, so you got to protect it. A lot of times you have to bury that, uh, those pots in mulch or something to protect uh, from the sun's radiant heat. And uh, also, kind of what Ellen had mentioned is you're gonna to have to backfill typically with potting soil and a, a non-native uh, dirt. And then you get this pot effect when you transplant it. But mm -hmm. the other thing that's, you do get more height on it. Uh, so if you're, you know, need, need that, you know, putting it in a pot for a year or two isn't the worst idea either. So if you planted a, a tree seedling, a bare root seedling, and you planted a regular container tree, Will that bare root seedling take off as far as height? Would it actually catch up while the other one is, even though the other one has height already, could they be basically the same height later on? Or is that not a good theory? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think there's actually quite a bit of, uh, of research and anecdotal evidence that the bare root seedlings, containerized seedlings, because you do have all the roots because it's been growing in the container, they typically will, it's the bare roots where so much of that root system has been severed in the transplanting process that a lot of times they sit there and they sit there for several years trying to reestablish the root system that it needs to support that crown and stem and uh, where the, the others, they have all the root system. So, so there are there is a transplant shock, but they get it over it much quicker. So those bare roots normally by the I think I think I was reading somewhere about year ten, uh, they have caught up to a one and a half two inch caliber bald and burlap. Uh, the problem is is bald and burlap provided an immediate effect for ten years, and now all of a sudden you know where you've gone through this phase of you got this little dinky tree in your yard and you're trying not to kill it with your weed eater or your lawnmower for a lot of years. Uh, so, uh, you know, just there's pros and cons. <laughs> right. but they say that about for every inch in diameter a tree is when you put it into the ground, it's going to be at least that many years that it's like recouping roots, not even putting on new growth, just recouping the lost uh, root system. Because you imagine, you know, the root system should be much, much larger than it is when you put that in the ground. So some of these really large um, trees that are installed in kind of landscape settings, um, it will actually be a long time before they put on any new growth. Uh, and you'd probably, yeah, if you wait 10 years, you're, you're smaller trees would be doing much better. Um, but that's, you know, that's, that's a, those are pros and cons of those two different options. I do we think that, oh, oh, go ahead. Oh, as I say, we had a question that someone wanted to know if you took your seedlings and potted them and then set that, set them out this fall, would that be all right? Yeah. Yeah. If you can water them and keep them happy in those pots and when you plant them, make sure you don't have those roots that are kind of just circling, circling the pot. Or if you do, make sure you kind of divide that up because uh, otherwise that, that kind of girdling root uh, situation can continue to impact the growth of that tree long term. Ellen, I wanted to circle back on one of the things you were talking about in your video about the volcano trees. You know, often when, you drive, <laughs> when I drive yeah. around Lexington, I see it quite commonly, like multiplied up, like, you know, two feet up the base of the tree. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A lot of people are doing that. So. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, I think 
part of what it is, I mean, some people like the look of it, which I don't, but you know, to each their own beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Um, but I encourage you, if you do like the look of it, you know, maybe change your viewpoint because the tree doesn't like it. But I think what happens is that, you know, you might put a little bit on each year and just add a little bit more, whether it needs it or not, you know, and pile a little bit more. And if a little bit of mulch is good, surely a lot of mulch is great, right? No. Um, it turns out that trees, that is not great for them. So the part that's, it, it might all see the same, but the part that's the trunk wants to be above ground and the parts that's the roots want to be below ground. Um, and if you put the trunk below ground, it can rot. And especially if you've got that mulch there, it's holding moisture in a perfect environment for decay of fungi and insects to get in there and degrade that trunk. Um, also what you're doing is you're kind of uh, by proxy planting that tree way too deep because you've piled up all this mulch underneath. And if you plant trees too deep, not only can it impact the way that those roots are gonna grow because they need access to oxygen and they typically are gonna grow laterally kind of out closer to the surface than you might think, um, but you can kind of stress your tree over time. That's the most common problem I see with trees planted in the landscape setting is that they're planted too deep and it's not gonna kill the tree tomorrow or even next year, but it will be like, why is this tree struggling? Why is this tree not thriving in the way that I want to? Why does it have all these random diseases and insect problems? And if the problem was, oh, it was planted too deep 20 years ago, it's really hard to go back and fix that. Yeah, which is a shame, you know, because people aren't doing it to try to kill the tree. No. You wouldn't know. I mean, they think they're doing the right thing, but they just don't realize the problem. So I appreciate yeah. you kind of yeah, and different trees are different. Some trees can deal with that very well, others less so. Um, I see we had uh, some, some questions about kind of shallow, the roots that are visible on the surface. There are lots of different things that can cause that, um, whether it's that that tree's roots are like desperately trying to get access to oxygen <laughs> and they're kind of circling and up there on the surface to the fact that, you know, these tree roots are actually quite shallow. Um, that you might think that the tree is going to look like the same way it does above ground, below ground, but that's not what it really happens. A lot of times they'll send out these shallow roots. And if you have any kind of erosion to that soil surface, you might expose some of those. If you're seeing that kind of situation, I might encourage you to kind of uh, put a little bit of mulch around there, at least to protect those roots. I know one common kind of challenge that results in situations like that is if you have roots that are exposed on the soil and you're trying to grow grass there, it's pretty much impossible not to to mow those roots, right? <laughs> Not to nick up those exposed roots with your mower, um, but that's going to be a perfect entry point for decay fungi. Uh, so kind of taking away some of that conflict right there. So what make happens your if you have sprouts? Yeah, you have sprouts coming from those roots as well. What happened? What do you do with those? Well, uh, it depends. It depends on the form that you want for your tree. Do you want a multi-stemmed form or do you want a strong single leader? It depends on the species. That's more common for some species than others. Um, typically, though, I prune those. But if you're seeing a lot of those, uh, it could be a sign of tree stress. Sometimes you'll see that type of growth when trees are stressed. Um, I see that we have a question about oak seed seedlings growing from acorns. And I know that on the line joining us today, mm -hmm. we have the expert on growing oak trees from acorns. Uh, if Darren is available, maybe he could talk a little bit about that. Hey, Darren. Yeah, we so white oak specialist. Yeah, right. So as far as oaks and, and transplanting them, really a year works well. You know, there's a reason to grow them for a year. Um, if you're transplanting them, if you're transplant those to a forest setting, you've got some shade issues. Uh, those really need to be uh, grown and cared for until they're at least four feet tall before they can uh, compete. However, um, I would I would just say, you know, let them go through a summer and then go dormant in the fall before you transplant them and move them. Yeah, good tip. Good tip. You know, and I think you bring up a good point too, Darren. You know, it can be challenging to plant tree seedlings in a, an established forest. Um, you know, it's, you're, you're competing against big root systems, so it makes it really hard. You got to put a lot of work into them. Yeah, different challenges. 
Right. But planting seeds is another option. You're going to have a lot less success, mm -hmm. but there's some great resources out there too. If that's something you're interested in directly planting seeds, uh, you're not going to get the same survival, <laughs> but it's also a lot less work. So. No doubt. And they're a lot lighter than a giant big old tree, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, Definitely. Uh, you know, Ellen, one other thing I wanted to mention, and Eric was talking a little bit about it, was, um, you know, if you're a landowner and you're trying to do a large planting, um, not only can you get assistance from the Division of Forestry to kind of select the trees, help you plan them, give you technical guidance, but the forester can also help you um, connect with Natural Resources Conservation Service, who has some programs through their Environmental Quality Incentive Program that allows um, some call share assistance to get some of those plantings done. So, you know, not only do you get good technical guidance from your forester, you can also get some financial assistance support too. So I'll just remind you if you're a landowner, do that. And if you're planning a big tree planting, probably need to wait till next year. Um, you can get ready for it because um, right now we're probably a little bit late if you've not done anything to get ready for that. Yeah, just another great reason why you should connect with your forester and NRCS and your county extension office because they might have tree giveaways that could be a great um, opportunity for you. Yeah, so plan ahead if you're going to do a tree planting and make sure you've got the right tree for the right site and, uh, you know, and you'll be uh, set up for success. Definitely. All right. Well, thank you both for joining us and Darren, yeah, we appreciate yeah. you joining us as well. Yeah, and Laurie, thanks for the uh, tree of the week. Appreciate that. So, you know. Trees, trees, trees. Trees, trees, and packed full of information. We'd never uh, disappoint with that. <laughs> That's it, it was a good, good segment, a lot of great questions. Thank you all for your interaction with the show. We really appreciate it. If you've got any follow-up questions, you know, hit us back on Facebook or shoot us an email and um, we'll be happy to respond. And you can always go to fromthewoodstoday.com to get any of our episodes. So if you're like, oh, what did Ellen say about that tree? You can, you know, just rewind her and watch it as many times as you need to, to find out what exactly um, was said. But like we have over, well, I guess 101 shows now <laughs> that uh, are on there. So you can go to our YouTube channel um, from fromthewoodstoday.com and, and find out all the information. Yeah, no but doubt. we greatly appreciate you joining us and we will see you next Wednesday at 11 o'clock. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. From the woods today.